welcome to learning to Tami and welcome to Freya. Thank, Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for your time and your willingness to create something together. So, it's a delight and a discovery, <laughs> <laughs> an adventure. Great. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I think I'm not going to introduce you. I think I will leave it to you because, yeah, maybe we can start with um, um, with this very simple question, and it's about who you are, or okay. how you would describe yourself. Hmm. Uh, I'm Freya Seacrest. We'll start there. Mm -hmm. I'm. Uh, <clears throat> I'm learning to be present as a human being on Earth. There's a broad description. Um, I work with the Lorraine Association and I work with online education mostly in helping other people, supporting people to discover parts of themselves uh, as engaged in a living universe. Um, yeah, I'm a mother. I'm a grandmother. I'm a participant. I want to really fully engage in life and in living. And for me, that includes um, a lot of connection with the natural world and in with the inner life underlying all of the world. But I came to that understanding through my own um, background, I suppose, in a very traditional Christian sort of background, but I always felt, well, there's something a little bit more. It's not just one um, doctrine or the other. There's something that links them all. And I've always, since a young age, seen that. That was took me, um, I didn't want to just join one church. I wanted to understand this sort of underlying impulse that I felt I noticed with any religion. Uh, or within different religions that I started looking into at an old, at a young age. And then I ended up here at Fintorn when mm -hmm. I was just 20. I had been in Europe doing a, uh, a study on the sociological impact of pollution in Ireland. <laughs> That's what was allowing me to, to come to Europe was to do this study. And I completed that. And as soon as I did, I bumped into people who had heard about Fintorn, who had heard about this sort of other more um, mystical or I didn't know what to call it. It was just something that had a little bit more of an essence. It was sort of mysterious, a little bit more of, of love to it, a little bit more of people who were seeking to demonstrate what their beliefs purported to be, uh, a little bit more of recognizing something special in everything. Mm -hmm. So I came to Fintorn and ended up staying for a number of years. Uh, that is what then led to my working with the Lorraine Association and has continued as a theme for me. Really coming to Fintorn felt like it was finishing college because I didn't go back to school. I stayed here at Fintorn. I have subsequently gone back to, to college and gotten degrees. but. At that point, it was a statement of um, this is what had meaning to me and this is what I wanted to graduate in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I didn't find that in any traditional colleges, mm -hmm. even in religious studies. This was, this was an exploration and the aliveness of the world mm -hmm. in some in unique ways. So I lived here and, and went then back to the States. Um, three years later. And when you say this is what I want to graduate in, what can I think it? Uh -huh. um, the sense of the aliveness, the heart, the sacredness of all of life, mm -hmm. that was what I found at Fintorn that felt like it responded to that question that I had had about, well, it's not just one religion or another religion, it's something what's underlying them all. What what connects them and that sacredness, my way of, of expressing that has come to be 
that's a sense of sacredness mm. in all of life. Um, Dorothy McLean here, who is a, one of the founders here at Findhorn, she used to call God the life force in everything. So that life force is what I would speak to as that energy of sacredness. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what I touched into here and seemed to be an answer to my questing for connection mm -hmm. with more than just one line of thinking mm -hmm. so that I could begin to appreciate the diversity in the world as furthering one, one fullness of life rather than <clears throat> having to narrow it all down to one of those threads as being the answer. Together, all those threads are a tapestry. Mm -hmm. And that's what I see as the sacred. Mm -hmm. Okay, so while you were talking, um, I was curious to know how did you know that that was the thing you wanted to understand better or <laughs> to graduate in, <laughs> as you said. Um, I have found over the years that my way of knowing is just that, is a sense of knowingness. And in a way, it's more full-bodied. It's not just a mental knowingness, though a thought can come through your mind and it's like, oh yes, it seems to have a certain weightedness to it. But my way of knowing at that time wasn't so much based on, oh, this is a specific uh, set of ideas, and I can believe in that or those I would. But it was more a sense of a feeling, I can stand here. If all of myself can stand here. I don't have to have, it's not just a mental mm -hmm. piece that I'm, I'm agreeing to. It's not emotional. We don't have this sort of feeling. It's camaraderie, but that's not the only thing that's holding this all together. Um, or it's not even just, oh, I like the way they do things. Mm -hmm. You know, that sort of physical. It was more of a, a coming together of all of it and an appreciation of the process of discovery, mm -hmm. of the process of asking the question that it wasn't a settled uh, doctrine. <laughs> It was a, a commitment. It was a, it was coherent, but it was living and changing and growing with me. There is more to discover. Mm -hmm. So that's what Findhorn represented to me, and that's how I took it in as that initial place. Mm -hmm. But it was also part of my own religious or spiritual searchings before Findhorn. Findhorn was in a way, I was searching to get to this point, to have a place where people had answers that were more open and more exploratory than what I had found before. And each thing is a step along the way. It doesn't mean it's wrong, but it was just, okay, that opened up my ideas, that opened up my experience. So my sense of knowing was included a body sense, included a body... Uh, feeling of rightness, which over the years, um, the, the sensation of it, because I don't know that it's just physical, the sensation of it is a feel of rightness, a certain uh, solidness mm -hmm. to, yes, this is a place to stand. And in that sense, I might have images of <clears throat> possibility. Mm. Whereas if it's an idea and it's sort of something in and of itself, which is a nice idea, but doesn't include some of that felt sense and that body knowing, doesn't include that I can stand there for very long, mm -hmm. it doesn't have the same weightedness. It doesn't have the same coherence for me. It can fly by and you might get a new idea from it and think, oh, that's nice, but it doesn't land. Mm -hmm. Those are all very vague ideas in trying to connect. So but that's, we work with something, um, a process that was started with Eugene Genlin, which he called felt sense. 
and, so, and, and I've done some work with somatic knowing and the sense of including the body. But I find my own inner knowingness includes the body, but it's not just located there. It includes the mind. As I've said, all those elements are included in it. And the sensation of it is more this sense of, um, I can live here. I can rest here. It, it, it can go for the long term. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. Okay. Yes, another question I would like to ask you is very much related to what you are describing because it's about how you become yourself every day. Um, how do I become myself every day? Mm-hmm. So, in other words, how do you listen to your inner voice in your uh, everyday life? You know, it's not a, a, it's not a separate action. It's something that I, over the years, have woven into my life as a way, as the way I approach life. Mm-hmm. It is to be approaching my day with listening. Mm-hmm. So it's the stance I take towards the day, <laughs> to living. I specifically, uh, I, I can go through different rhythms, but often it has included, I like waking up slowly. So I have a, a kind of a slow interface to getting up for the day. I really hate waking up to alarms. I <laughs> really hate waking up to alarms. Uh, and what that does is it gives me a little bit of quiet time before I move into the busyness of the day. Uh, and it's, I don't know that it would be traditionally called a meditation time, but it has the same function in my life. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I will just be quiet and wake up listening, listening to my dreams as I sort of wake up and they kind of begin to merge then into maybe some thoughts of the day or maybe some creative thoughts. If I'm writing something, I will move into that. And there is a sense of colleagueship to that sometimes when I wake up, if I'm working on a project and I have a sense of my inner colleagues being present. And so I'll come out of that sleep state through that kind of thing. And then there's a little bit of listening as I move my thought more forward into the day of what's going to be happening, what do I need to look to be taken care of. Um, that, that is one way that I approach the day that helps set. When, when I have that option, it helps set my day uh, e- into a relatively easy flow. Mm-hmm. One of the things that I think that I do is I look to check myself in my approaching the other people in my life, the situations in them, what I might be engaged in working with, am I approaching them with respect and honor? That's one of the ways that my inner listening, I make possible inner listening. Mm -hmm. Um, So that what comes to me then is an idea or a possibility or an action, that I've set a field of being responsive not only to my own thoughts, but to the world around me. Mm-hmm. In my teaching, we work with uh, the idea of manifestation. And one of the steps in the manifestation that we work with <clears throat> through David Spangler's book, is, which is what we've used for a, a, a text, is the fact that there's what we might want and what we might intend, but there's also the intention and the beingness of that which we want to have in our life, mm-hmm. the needs and the, the the needs and the rhythms and the patterns of what we might want to bring into our life. Mm-hmm. So the whole uh, act of manifestation is about bringing those two together, my needs and intentions, but also the needs of intentions of whatever I'm hoping will I can connect with mm-hmm. in my life. I speak to that only because it's an attitude that I feel like I've carried in. And I do think that that's a, 
at the root of my inner knowing, mm -hmm. that attitude of wanting to connect um, makes it more possible for me to see the sacred in everything and therefore be in connection mm -hmm. with the sacred in everything and in myself. It's um, very fascinating and it looks like it's so much part of your life mm. that it's almost automatic. No, it's there are definitely times that I have to choose okay. <laughs> to bring myself back to attention. <laughs> and how do you do it? Yeah. How do I do that? I suppose it's a little bit like being mindful, mm -hmm. but I sometimes it really is about stopping myself, recognizing this is not a pattern that I'm enjoying. I'm feeling resentful. I'm feeling annoyed. I'm feeling tense. Um, I have to stop that, or at least recognize that that is there. And sometimes I can't jump just automatically to loving a situation or another person or sort of what's happening. I have to go a little bit more slowly. I have to give myself permission to stand at the step where I am. Mm -hmm. And in a way, that's given me a little bit more of my relationship with the sacred in that it, it will, con it, the sacredness, will, the sacred will configure to me as much as I'm trying to configure to it. Mm. I remember once, at a time when I was feeling, I give myself to service. I give myself to God. Mm -hmm. I give myself. I want my life to serve that sacredness in the world. And what I felt come back to me was the knowing that the way to do that, that what God wanted, or that life force, gender, that deep mystery, sacred, was for me to be fully myself. Mm -hmm. was for me to be fully in my life in such a way as to uh, bring out, it, to affirm sacredness in my life, I guess. That would be one way to say it. Um, and by doing that, I could really, I was being of service. Mm -hmm. So by not giving up my, it's like I, gave, I was trying to give up my life in behalf of service, mm -hmm. and what came back to me was my life. Mm-hmm. So it's like, here, I want you to be fulfilled. I want you to be happy. I want you to live your life fully. Mm -hmm. And that, I suppose, as much as anything, has kept me in the spiritual life. It's like, because I gave, but I also was given to. It, it, wasn't, um, it wasn't sacrifice that was being asked of me. Mm -hmm. It was participation and engagement and joy. Uh, so that has made my spiritual path one that I have wanted to stay on. Mm -hmm. It wasn't. It wasn't about lessons. It was about enjoyment and engagement. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, but you were saying that you still are have. Um, experiences of um, feeling that are not so uh, enjoyable. Right? Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. Because I think, um, yeah, for me it's important not to um, say that there are also uh, aspects of life that are challenging and mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so it's like, how do you deal with them? What do you usually do? Usually what I need to do, if I'm trying to look at it as a big general usually, because it's often very specific, uh, but the root of it is about coming back to that place of stillness in myself. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes when I'm resentful or angry or out of sorts, out of kilter, um, <clears throat> it's because 
I haven't been listening enough. Mm-hmm. Not to just a voice within myself, but to my life. Um, how do I describe it? I had an interesting experience once in some somatic counseling work that I was training in, and the leader, the facilitator, there was someone who was coming up in front to be a, um, an example, or you know, they were willing to try out this process. And there was a group of us watching, and he, in this very sensitive and vulnerable work, to stand up in front of a group and and be working on a process with someone else, to be the exemplar, to be the guinea pig. And the the process started and the facilitator was leading and that person was, and they had the sense, you can have the sense that they, the, um, the person who was up, who had volunteered, was a little bit uncomfortable. And we were all very interested in trying to learn and trying to watch and trying to notice and really keen. And the facilitator says, stop, just, you know, move your energy back. That we were taking up too much of the space. Literally, we were taking too much of the energetic space in the room, the psychic space in the room. So this person, it was very difficult for them to come out, to sort of put themselves out to discover more. That was this interesting example for me about inner listening. It's like when I'm too full of myself and putting out, <clears throat> putting out a lot of energy, there isn't room, as it were, for the world to meet me, mm-hmm. the world to step forward so that I, there isn't room for listening because I'm filling up the space so much. My image for myself of that has to do with realizing what I wanted to do was to be still enough, very full of myself. I needed to be present. I wasn't out of the room. I'm not blanking out. I am being just centered in myself enough where I can show up, I'm there, I know how to stand and not fall over, but I'm holding my hand and there might be some food and I'm still enough that a a deer might come and eat out of my hand. Mm -hmm. That to me is is a way to energetically describe what my place of inner listening is like. I have to show up, I have to be present. I can't be out of the room and just spacing out. I have to be very, very physically present in order to hold the corn for the deer to eat. Mm-hmm. But I also have to be not filling up all the space with tension or um, emotions or restlessness. I have to be able to be at peace, I guess, or still. And so. Like I say, I, I come to sort of some of this through body knowing, through a sense of uh, an imagery. And that is the image for me that I often call back in terms of bringing myself. So what that might mean is I might need a 10-minute nap. I might need a, a vigorous walk outside in nature to get to get myself breathing again. I might need to just sit down and be still. Um Stillness isn't always about no motion. Mm-hmm. It, uh, all of those are elements of my sense of inner listening. Mm-hmm. But that physical sense of being still enough to let a deer come, that I don't startle a deer uh, who would come and eat something out of my hand, but there's enough space for them where I'm not you know, pushing it on there. Um, that's a way for me to describe inner listening. Mm-hmm. Does that, and you ask how I do when I, you know, so if I'm agitated or not in that place, I will do, like I said, you know, different things. Um, as a mother, I grew very fond of naps. <laughs> I gave timeouts for the kids and for me. <laughs> So, in a very practical way, that was true. I mean, we needed timeouts, both of us. Mm-hmm. Either that or we went swimming. <laughs> swimming or taking a bath, you know, when we went in a place where we could swim. Mm-hmm. Water was often very good. Had that same effect, I guess. Mm-hmm. That sense of um, allowing yourself to be present in yourself, and you're aware of, own, but you're not extending out too much. Mm-hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, 
Another question I have is um, uh, related to, the, to your experience in Pinthorn. Uh -huh. So, um, and it's about how you re engage with the world out there after you spend some time here. Because we um, often say that Pinthorn is a place for planetary and individual transformation, and you know, it's very much about. Um, learning how to be ourselves and then bring it out. But for me, it's not always clear, or maybe it's something that I still I'm still working on you know, how to engage with life. I left Fintorn after two and a half years. It felt the right time in my my class, as it were, my sort of group of people, it's like something was coming to a completion. And I thought, if what we're doing here at Findorn is true, then it needs to be true anywhere and everywhere. And I'm American, and I want to go back to the States, to where my family and my roots are. And that really was my uh, intent, <clears throat> was here was something that was wonderful, and it had been great fun, and it also needed to be true anywhere, not just in one particular place, if it was really real. So I set out as a way, in a way, to try and prove that it could work to myself. Mm -hmm. uh, part of when I left, I, I was around a group of people that I knew here, so I wasn't um, moving back to where no one understood what I had been about here. So I had that support. So I had some support, but we were also, we had no money and we were finding jobs and we were trying to figure out how to rent a place and um, get started again. So we had all those normal concerns. Uh, but again, it was how we approached doing those things, trying to do it with a sense of, of respect and awareness of the, the life and the value of everything around us. Mm -hmm. So, I still am doing a lot of moving. I haven't, you know, we've just moved to a new place. And I come to this town not knowing anyone or anything. I, I have a little pattern. For me, there's something that I love or connect. I find one thing that I can love or connect with mm -hmm. where I am. One thing I value, where I am right now, we moved there in part because we're right next to the um, Lake Michigan, the Great Lakes in the United States. Mm -hmm. And I love water and I love swimming. And it's a little bit of wild. This lake is a little wild and untamed, even though it's a, not a lake. It's, it's a lake, not an ocean. So I have that one thing that I love. And then I start looking around it at the other things that relate to it and realize we have this in common. And there's lots of neighbors there who have different lifestyles and different backgrounds, and but they all love being on the lake. And in my little neighborhood, we have a place where we can go and watch the sunset. Mm -hmm. So we may not share a lot of anything else, but we all enjoy the sunsets. So that gives me a, a connection of loving that for me builds a sense of community that was here it's not quite as totally involved a community, but where we share something because of what we appreciate. We have that in common. And if I build that, if I work from that, what I have in common, rather than what I don't have in common, which I could look at and say, I don't have a lot in common with these folks, I start to have a relationship that allows kindness and consideration and thoughtful acts and supportive acts to start to unfold just naturally from that. Mm -hmm. That for me is how I I feel like I made the transition mm -hmm. from Finthorn to another place. Because this is life too. Finthorn has its um, community conversations <laughs> and discussions and controversies and not everyone thinks in exactly the same way. Mm -hmm. And so, but what there is here 
that is shared is an intent to trying to stay with it to to open up to the possibility of finding a connection so if I go out into the world open to the possibility of finding a connection I am stretched I have been stretched and expanded and surprised um, <clears throat> It's unexpected to find myself having something in common with a right wing or a socialist or um, a right wing fundamentalist or a social. And it's it's unexpected, and I have to hold open the possibility that in truth they might have um, they have children too, and we love our children. For example, um, that's that's how I do it or I have done it, is looking first for what we do have in common. Thank you. Yeah. And another question about thinghood, because you mentioned, um, yeah, you said if it was, uh, if it's real, what we were doing here, mm -hmm. it has to be real also mm -hmm. out there. Um, I guess because I've been here for a few years, I can connect with this, what it's real here. Mm -hmm. But for people who have not been here, how would you describe this experience, the experience of Finland, the experience you had of Finland? For me, it's come down to working with love. Um, that's the core of it. I feel I was here in the time when Eileen was still alive and Dorothy was here and Peter was here and for all their different approaches to things they were trying to work. What it meant to me when I heard them talking about following their inner guidance or their inner attunement was about being more loving. As a, as a person and finding ways to use love as a connection with the world. Um, and we work with something in my educational work where it uh, uh, has been called the spectrum of love so that there's a range of the ways that love can express. There's um, the sort of deep love or agape or something, but there's also, it goes back to honor, respect, and then even might just start with just perceiving. Being able to perceive someone else is an initial stage of being able to, of love. Mm -hmm. That recognition to perceive and recognize another being is an act of connection. And essentially that is what love is for me. The ability to, to connect. Um, So now I've forgotten your initial question, but that that to me is what Finthorn is about, and it's like to say that we could love the plants, we could love each other, we could love machines, we could love that the world is alive in that way. All of those were elements of where Finthorn carried its love and had examples of how that worked and how it helped life to flow more easily. Um, how it made it could make things richer and unexpected things would happen. That's what I thought. Well, if that can be true here, it needs to be true anywhere, not just because it's some special mm -hmm. um, PowerPoint. So it's that working with that capacity to love and be open to the world around me mm -hmm. and to love myself. <laughs> that was perhaps a bigger part of loving <laughs> my loving lessons that are ongoing <laughs> thank you for mentioning <laughs> yes. um, I'm, I'm still thinking of um, someone who may uh, listen or read uh, this mm -hmm. interview and um, it has not had the experience of being her, you know, someone who is not, who has not, let's say, transformed her or his life. 
So, uh, is there um, anything that you would like to say? <laughs> um, we have the capacity to choose. And in that choice, make a difference. It, we may not be able to choose big. I can't choose to make peace happen in the world. Poof. Um, or I can't think or meditate peace into being by itself. Uh, but I can be more peaceful. I can choose to be more peaceful. And that to me was the lesson of Vindhorn was that I could choose to change my own attitude. I could change the way I approach the world. I worked with Dorothy McLean, one of the founders here, for a number of years. I, we came together in the States when she was just beginning. She thought, I need to do workshops. And I had had some experience with groups of people. So I, together we created her, her workshops and did them together for a number of years in Toronto. And then she started traveling more around the world. And I went and got married and had children and <laughs> stayed in one place for a while. Um, but that time with with uh, with Dorothy uh, was really a, a wonderful learning time for me, and also sort of stretching into my own capacities to say that I I could know more about making choices and the small the small ways, and seeing that come back again and again and what difference that would make. That really helped cement, I suppose, or, or really fix my Pintorn time. But but even here, we we choose and we choose to make a difference. But the place we have to act on that and make a difference is through our own life, through our own immediate choices. Now sometimes it grows out from there in bigger ways very quickly, or sometimes it may just be stay in that most intimate circle. Either one is a contribution to the world. And that's something that Fintorn, I suppose, set me on the path of, mm -hmm. to say that my life can make a difference, not judging that by volume, as it were, or how big my bubble was, or how many people I knew, but it was, <clears throat> it made a difference in quality with each of those relationships that I had. So in that, that's one of the ways I think it doesn't have to be at Findorn or it's wonderful to come here and to connect with other people who are working in that way. And we each have those daily choices if we would believe in them mm -hmm. and let the world transform from that uh, grassroots, that grassroots place. That's definitely where we can add. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. I need a little bit of time to see if there is anything else that is coming to me. I feel quite complete. Uh -huh. Um, I don't know if there is anything else you would like to add. Mm. Nothing comes to mind at the moment. Mm -hmm. I think I would say something to encourage people. I would love to feel that people could be encouraged to enjoy their life mm. and enjoy their situation, enjoy their set of circumstances for what it is. Uh, because each of us is a contribution. 
the lessons we are learning, the challenges we meet, the way we choose to meet them, is an opportunity to bring the sacred into life, to bring the sacred into form. I had a, an, a, a vision, I suppose, just an image at one point, of human beings as lightning rods, connecting the energy of the sacred with the earth. And it came through us, mm -hmm. as, as, it, as lightning does through a lightning rod, to, to ground itself. And so that's always been an image and an encouragement for me about the role, that we humans have a role mm -hmm. in all of this, that we're not empty, We're not empty, hollow shells. We have a place, a way that we can go, and we have two feet, and we can walk to where that energy might be needed. And the first place we have to walk is our own lives, and the people who need it in our, um, or would benefit from that sense of, that blessing of the sacred, uh, that blessing of love, so, I would encourage people that they look around them and with those, with their own eyes of love <laughs> and what they notice that they can love and know that that's one way that the sacred is able to bring him, her, itself into our world uh, and be a gift and be a place of new possibility for the world. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> I feel so full of life and joy. Oh, good. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you. It's nice to be asked such questions. It's like you don't, we don't always do it, but having the conversations are, yeah, very supportive. So I appreciate and applaud the work you're doing to try and bring this out. Thank you. Mm. Thank you so much.